Iran after the death of Nadir Shah. Zender. Establishment of the power of the Qajar dynasty. Immediately after the assassination of Nadir Shah, the disintegration of his state began. The Afghans, led by Ahmed Khan Abdali, who were in the service of Nadir, having plundered Nadir's camp, fled to Kandahar. Relying on his Abdali tribe, which he renamed Durrani, Ahmed Khan united a number of Afghan tribes. Soon he also took possession of Herat, Punjab and Kashmir and declared himself an independent ruler. After the death of Nadir Shah, Afghanistan was never part of Iran again. The Khans who killed Nadir Shah proclaimed his nephew Ali Kuli Khan Shah in Mashhad under the name of Adil Shah. In an attempt to consolidate his position, Adil Shah issued a decree exempting the population from paying arrears for previous years, ordinary taxes for one year and emergency taxes for two years. He also ordered to return to the old owners, mainly the Shiite clergy, the lands confiscated by Nadir Shah. That is why he was given the name Adil Shah, just Shah. But these measures failed to strengthen his position. A year later, he was overthrown and blinded by his brother Ibrahim. This was followed by a whole series of palace coups and civil strife. By 1751, there was not even a nominal ruler left in Iran. The country broke up into a number of small feudal estates, the rulers of which were constantly fighting among themselves for power. In Khorasan, with the help of the Afghan detachments of Ahmed Khan Durrani, a formerly independent state was founded, in the smoothness of which the grandson of Nadir Shorok, blinded during civil strife, was placed. In fact, Khorasan was under the control of the Afghans. In Ustrabad, and then in Mazandaran, one of the leaders of the Qajar tribe, the son of Qajar Khan killed by Nadir Fathali, Muhammad Hassan Khan, established himself. Southern Azerbaijan was ruled by one of the commanders of Nadir Azad Khan from the tribe of Afghans Gilzais. The Khanates of northern Azerbaijan became virtually independent. In Dilan, one of the local influential feudal lords, Hidoyatola Khan, declared himself an independent ruler. who subsequently negotiated with the Russian government on accepting him into Russian citizenship and on joining Jalan to Russia. Isfahan was occupied by the leader of the Barkshir tribes Ali Mardan Khan and the leader of the Zen tribe Karim Khan. In 1753, in the struggle that ensued between them, Ali Mardan Khan was killed and Karim Khan became the sole ruler of a significant part of southern Iran. After that, a struggle began between Karim Khan and Azad Khan of Afghanistan and Muhammad Hassan Khan Kaja. A year later, Azad Khan was forced to surrender to Karim Khan, who thus subjugated Azerbaijan. The struggle of Karim Khan with Muhammad Hassan Khan Kaja continued with varying success until 1758, when Karim Khan managed to defeat the Qajars as well. Muhammad Hassan Khan Kaja was killed. By 1760, Karim Khan subjugated Kerman, Yezd, that is, almost all of Iran, with the exception of only Khorasan, which was ruled by the blind Sharo. Formally, Karim Khan did not declare himself Shah. The descendant of the Safavids, who had earlier been proclaimed Shah by him together with Ali Mardan Khan, he put in prison. He called himself only Vekal, or authorized. Karim Khan chose the city of Shiraz in Fars as his capital. Most likely that he chose Shiraz because this city lay in the center of the pastures used by those tribes on which Karim Khan relied in his struggle with the Qajars and other rivals. As a result of long-term internecine wars and unrestrained exploitation and robberies by pretenders to the throne and other large and small Khans. By the time Karim Khan established power over all of Iran, agriculture, and crafts were in a state of extreme decline. Trade, both external and internal, almost completely froze. In order to prevent the process of further collapse of the country's economy, as well as to consolidate his position as a ruler, Karim Khan was forced to take some measures aimed at the development of agriculture, crafts and trade. He issued firmans, decrees, 
which somewhat limited the exploitation of the peasants and the arbitrariness of the Khans in relation to them. These decrees established certain norms, within which the Khans had to collect natural and monetary duties from the peasants. Decrees were also issued to encourage and protect the craft. By order of Karim Khan, attempts were made to establish large workshops. In Shiraz, for example, glass factories were set up, the products of which were known not only in Iran itself, but also in neighboring states. The city of Shiraz enjoyed special attention of Karim Khan. Here he tried to gather those artisans and craftsmen whom Nadir Shah brought from India and who, during civil strife, scattered throughout the country. There was a lot of construction going on in Shiraz. Vast palaces and other buildings were built. By order of Karim Khan, a bazaar, a mosque, as well as tombs on the graves of famous Iranian poets Sadi and Hulfez were built in Shiraz. Karim Khan, in opposition to the religious policy of Nadir, patronized Shiism and the Shiite clergy. Under Karim Khan, measures were also taken to develop foreign and domestic trade. With robberies and robberies on the caravan routes, the struggle was again begun. In 1761, the British moved their trading post from Banda Abbas to Basra. In an effort to prevent a further reduction in foreign trade, Karim Khan in 1763 granted the British a number of benefits. The right to own land in any amount and the right to build trading posts not only in Bundabusha, but also in other ports of the Persian Gulf. The British were allowed to trade freely in Iran, even without paying import and export customs duties. The English company was granted the exclusive right to import woolen products. The Iranian authorities undertook to force Iranian subjects to pay their debts to the British in the first place. Employees of the English trading posts were exempted from any taxes and were not subject to the Iranian court. In addition, they were granted a number of other benefits. Thus, already in the middle of the 18th century, the British, preparing the ground for the enslavement of Iran, sought exclusive rights and privileges. Granting these benefits to the British, Karim Khan, in turn, demanded that they not take out of Iran the gold and silver proceeds from the sale of their goods, but buy Iranian goods for it to take them out of Iran. As a result, in 1763 the British moved their trading post to Banda Busha. The English trading post existed in Busha only until 1770, when the British moved it back to Basra. In addition to the British, a very significant trade with Iran at that time was carried out by the Dutch. The Dutch even captured the island of Karg, Karak, in the Persian Gulf, located not far from Busha on the sea route to Basra, through which East Turkey and Western Iran traded with India. They founded a trading post on Karga, organized pearl fishing and erected fortifications. By blocking Basra, the Dutch intercepted part of its trade into their own hands. Within a short time, Karg turned into a center through which foreign trade with southwestern Iran went. But in 1776 the island was captured by an Arab sheikh from Benderig, the pirate Mir Mohana, who expelled the Dutch from there and thus put an end to their dominance in the Persian Gulf. In the second half of the 18th century, the positions of the Western European powers in Iran were still very weak. Ashlachan and the Dutch had their trading posts only on the islands of the Persian Gulf and on its coast. Their interests were limited so far exclusively to trade. European merchants have not yet had a significant impact on the country's economy and its political life. After the transfer of the English trading post from Busha to Basra, Karim Khan decided to take possession of the city, which lies at the mouth of the Shat al Arab River whose commercial importance has greatly increased. In 1775 Karim Khan sent his troops to Basra. It was announced to the troops and people that the campaign was undertaken in response to the oppression of the Iranian pilgrims by the Turks and to conquer the holy Shiite cities of Karbala and Najaf. In 1776, after a 13-month siege, Basra was taken by the Iranians. She stayed in their hands for a very short time, only three years. In 1779, after the death of Karim Khan, the Iranian troops left it, and it again came under the rule of the Turks. The respite received by Iran, during the peaceful years of the reign of Karim Khan,
had a beneficial effect on the economic condition of the country. Iran began to recover from the destruction caused by the Afghan invasion and the wars of Nadir Shah. But this respite was short-lived. After the death of Karim Khan in 1779, Iran again becomes the scene of feudal wars for power, first between the Zens, and then between the Zens and the Qajars. The struggle between the Zens ended with the fact that in 1782 Karim Khan's nephew Ali Murad Khan turned out to be the winner, who declared himself Shah in Isfahan. While the Zaids were fighting among themselves, in the north of Iran, in Mazandaran and Ustrabad, the Qajars were strengthening, led by the cruel and energetic Aga Mohammed, who was in Shiraz for over 15 years as an honorary hostage of Karim Khan. Before the death of Karim Khan Aga Mohammed fled from Shiraz, first to Tehran and then to Mazandaran. There a struggle for power also began between him and his brothers. Aga Mohammed emerged victorious from this struggle. True, in the future, the brothers repeatedly opposed Aga Mohammed, but all these speeches ended in their defeat. After the victory over the brothers, Aga Mohammed Khan began to extend his power to neighboring provinces. By 1783, he had already captured Ustrabad, the whole of Mazandaran and Jalan. Having subjugated these provinces, Aga Muhammad turned all his attention and strength to the fight against the Zens. In 1785, the Qajars occupied Tehran, Qom, Kashan and Isfagan. In 1790, Aga Muhammad approached Shiraz with his troops and laid siege to it. Shiraz at that time was ruled by the last of the Zend rulers, Lutfali Khan Zend. But this time Aga Muhammad was unable to capture the capital of the Zans and after a month-long siege he returned to Tehran. In 1791 Aga Muhammad captured almost all of Azerbaijan. In the same year, the Kalanta ruler of Shiraz, Haji Ibrahim, betrayed Lutf Ali Khan and went over to the side of Aga Muhammad Kaja. After that, the struggle between Aga Muhammad and Lutf Ali Khan Zend continued for several more years. In 1794, Aga Muhammad besieged Kerman with numerous troops, where Lutf Ali Khan took refuge. After a long siege, Kerman was taken, while Aga Muhammad subjected the population of the city to cruel reprisals. Women and children were given to the troops as slaves. He also ordered to gouge out the eyes of 20,000 inhabitants of Kerman. Lutf Ali Khan managed to escape, but he was soon caught in Bam and then killed on the orders of Aga Muhammad. Thus, by the end of 1794, Aga Muhammad emerged victorious from the fight against the Zens and his power was established in all the main provinces of Iran. With the exception of Khorasan and part of Kurdistan. It should be noted that along with the struggle with the Zens, and after this struggle was over, Aga Muhammad had to fight with many smaller Khans, who refused to recognize his supreme power over themselves. Capturing new provinces and districts of Iran, Aga Muhammad usually appointed the rulers of the most important areas of his closest relatives, or those fellow tribesmen, the Qajars, on whom he could fully rely. True, there were cases when Aga Muhammad left the old rulers in their places. But this happened only when the rulers of certain regions, and such rulers were essentially almost independent feudal princelings, submitted to Aga Muhammad without a fight. But even in this case, trying to prevent possible future uprisings of the Khans who obeyed him, he kept their relatives as hostages. With those Khans who fought against Aga Muhammad, persisted and did not want to give up, and then fell into his hands, he dealt with extremely cruelly. The property, Lands and villages of these Khans were confiscated. Aga Muhammad granted the confiscated lands and villages to his supporters, who were obliged for this to act with armed detachments to help Aga Muhammad at his call. Thus, Aga Muhammad not only deprived the Khans hostile to him of political power, but also took away their land holdings and other sources of income. By distributing confiscated lands to his supporters, he created support for himself in the person of Khans dependent on him. 
Such was the policy of Aga Muhammad in relation to the feudal Khans. He tried to subjugate the broad masses of the people, peasants and city dwellers, with the help of mass terror. Very often, Aga Muhammad used the forced relocation to remote desert places of families and entire tribes whom he did not trust and from whom he expected disobedience in the future. As early as 1785, Tehran was declared by Aga Muhammad as his capital. He chose Tehran because he wanted his main seat to be closer to the Ustrabad region and the tribes that lived there, on which he relied in the struggle for power. In addition, the southern regions of Iran were heavily devastated by the invasion of the Afghans and internecine wars between the Zens, and then between the Zens and the Qajars. The northern regions suffered less. The significance of the southern regions has also fallen sharply due to the reduction in trade between the Persian Gulf and the southern coast of Iran. The center of the Iranian economy thus moved from the southern regions to the northern ones, where Tehran was located. Around Tehran there were good pastures necessary for the cavalry, which constituted the bulk of the Qajar troops. As a result of all this, Tehran, relatively small and little known until that time, was made the capital by Aga Muhammad. At the end of 1794, Aga Muhammad began to prepare for an aggressive campaign against Shervan and Georgia. Aga Muhammad stated that since Georgia was subject to the Iranian shahs during the time of the Safavids, it must belong to Iran, it must be recaptured and included in its state. Aga Muhammad was in a hurry to march on Georgia because rumors had reached him that a movement for joining Russia was growing in Georgia. In 1783, the Georgian king Heraclius had already concluded an agreement with Catherine II on the establishment of a Russian protectorate over Georgia. In the spring of 1795, Aga Mohammed, with an army of several tens of thousands of people, moved to Georgia. The Transcaucasian Khanates which did not want to submit to him, as well as part of the regions of Georgia, were subjected to terrible devastation and plunder. Mass robberies and violence of the troops against the population during the campaigns were the usual means by which Aga Muhammad tried to intimidate and subdue the population. In September 1795, Iranian detachments approached Tbilisi, defeated the Georgian army and occupied Tbilisi. Detachments of Aga Muhammad, having entered Tbilisi, began terrible pogroms and massacres, which lasted for eight days. The city was plundered, many buildings were destroyed and burned. Thousands of people were killed. About 12,000 people were captured and taken to Iran. All these atrocities, the extermination and enslavement of many thousands of people, including the elderly, women and children, the destruction of historical monuments and cultural values were covered up by the Persian invaders with propaganda of the struggle for religion, for Islam. Having plundered Tbilisi, on September 20, 1795, Aga Muhammad set out with his detachments on the way back. This predatory raid on Georgia, and the atrocities of Aga Muhammad, and his hordes further strengthened Georgia's orientation towards Russia. Upon his return from a campaign in Georgia, in 1796, Aga Muhammad was crowned Shah of Iran in Tehran. Thus, at the end of the 18th century, the power of a new, Qajar dynasty was established in Iran. After the coronation, Aga Muhammad Shah marched east to capture Khorasan, which at that time was ruled by Nadir Mirza, the son of the blind Shorok, the grandson of Nadir Shah. When the Qajar detachments approached, Nadir Mirza fled from Mashhad to Afghanistan, leaving his father in the city. Shorok surrendered Mashhad to Aga Muhammad without a fight. Along with the desire to subjugate Khorasan, Aga Muhammad undertook his campaign against Mashhad also in order to seize the treasures of Nadir Shah, which he had taken out of India and were in the possession of Shorok. Using severe torture, 
Aga Muhammad forced Shorok to give him the treasures of Nadir. After the capture of Khorasan, Aga Muhammad again tried to capture Georgia and the Transcaucasian Khanates. In the spring of 1797, the hordes of Aga Muhammad crossed the Arak River. The fortress of Shusha surrendered to Aga Muhammad. But a few days after the occupation of Shusha, in June 1797, Aga Muhammad Shah was killed at night by two of his servants, whom he had sentenced to death the day before. The assassins of the Shah were connected with the disgruntled Khans, who sought to eliminate Aga Muhammad and seize power in their own hands. After the death of Aga Muhammad Shah, confusion and disorder began among his troops. The Khans, the heads of the detachments and the leaders of the tribes hurried to their possessions. Detachments of troops fled to their native places. Even during his lifetime, Aga Muhammad Shah appointed his nephew Fathali Khan, who was in Shiraz at the time of the murder of his uncle, as the heir to the throne. Having received the news of the Shah's death, he immediately went to Tehran. After a relatively short struggle with other contenders for the Shah's throne, Fath Ali established himself on the throne. But his power over Iran was largely formal. In the provinces and regions of Iran, there were feudal Khans who were little dependent on the Shah, who often not only did not want to pay taxes to the Shah's treasury, but sometimes refused to even formally recognize his authority.